All right, hi everybody and welcome to Meet Flame Tree Press, a panel for the fourth annual uh, Librarian's Day for the Horror Writers Association. I am Emily Vinci, uh, your host and moderator. I am the fiction manager at the Schaumburg Township District Library in Schaumburg, Illinois. Uh, and I am also a member of the Art Steering Committee. Art is a co-sponsor of this event. Um, a little bit about art. The Adult Reading Roundtable has been dedicated to developing readers' advisory skills uh, and promoting reading for pleasure through public libraries since 1984, uh, led by a steering committee of Chicago area librarians. Art plans and presents um, reader's advisory training, in-depth genre studies, book discussion training, and a wide variety of other professional development opportunities for librarians and library staff. Art is also a creator of the Art Popular Fiction List, uh, which is available to members of Art um, and is, what is also available for free to subscribers of Novelist Plus in their Reader's Advisory Toolbox. So thank you for letting me get that out. Uh, and again, welcome. We are here to uh, be introduced to Flame Tree Press and some of its authors. Uh, but first, we are going to start with Don, who is going to tell us a little bit about Flame Tree Press um, in general. So, Don, if you would like to tell us who you are and what you do. Uh, I'm Don Doria. I'm the executive editor at Flame Tree Press, uh, which means I do the acquisitions and editing development of the, uh, the, the books that we do. Uh, I edit horror, science fiction, fantasy, and crime thrillers, but I guess tonight we'll be talking uh, about horror. Uh, do you want to hear about Flame Tree in general, or do you want to wait on that until you know the next round, or help going to it? <laughs> yeah, we can uh, we can go around quickly. I forgot I was going to do this first. I apologize, and have everybody else just introduce themselves, uh, and then we'll we'll come back to Don to hear a little bit more about um, Flame Tree Press. So let me see here. where is my order. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> Sit tight. Um, all right, so now we're going to go to John. We will start with you. Um, who, who are you? Wait, I do How did you get here? Uh, hi, I am yeah. John Anderson. Um, I, have, I have been a horror author for most of my adult life, I guess. Um, and I've actually worked with Don Doria for a good amount of that time as well. Um, I, my first novel was Covenant, came out in 2004 originally on a small press and then uh, won a Bram Stoker award in 2005 and then came out in mass market in 2008. Uh, since then I have written about a dozen uh, not new novels since then. Um, working on number 13 right now. Almost done Don. Uh, that's me. All right. Thank you very much. All right. And then we will go to JG. Hi. Um, I'm J.G. Faraday, and uh, like the other authors here, I primarily write horror, although I dip my toes into other things like science fiction and fantasy. Um, I've been writing since 2000. I've got probably seven novels now and 11 novellas to my credit, and I really don't know what more to say than that. I got my start. My my inspiration came as a little kid when I just loved reading Poe and Shelley and Bram Stoker and Jules Verne and the Hardy Boys. You know, every kid loved the Hardy Boys. And ever since then, I've just loved horror. And when I finally had the chance to start writing it, I grabbed it. Great. We will uh, we'll continue alphabetically and now go to J.H. Hello. Um, well, what can I add to that? Um, so Don actually gave me my start in the industry. He published my first novella, so he will always have a special place in my heart. Thank you so much, Don, for doing that for me. I've been writing since I could pick up a crayon. At about five years old, I was writing little books uh, and kept writing. So obviously, it took me a while for those books to be successful. Probably the most interesting thing about me is I travel the world uh, visiting the most haunted places to write my books. And I write a lot of suspense and mystery as well as horror. That's about it. Great. So now, uh, Steve and Melissa, I don't know if you guys draw straws or you decide who talks first, um, <laughs> but I'll leave that to the two of you. Okay. 
Um, I'm Melissa Prusi. I'm, I guess, one of the rookies of the bunch, um, author, co-author, I should say, of Stoker's Wild and Stoker's Wild West. Uh, Don also gave us our start in the business, so yay, Don. We, we love that. Um, I've been I've been writing off and on since college, but um, we've had a, a few uh, screenplays option that never got made and things like that, but um, this is our first foray into publishing. Great. And I'm uh, Stephen Hopstaken. I'm the other co-author of Stoker's Wild and Stoker's Wild West. And uh, yes, Don gave us our first uh, sale and first novel. So thank, thank you for that. Great. I was gonna say, Thank you, everybody. I'm not saying anyone to say this, but I guess in a way I am. I mean, they have contracts. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now, Don, if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit more about Flame Tree Press, I guess, how it, it's a, it's a young imprint. So how did it sort of come about? Yep. Yeah, um, the Flame Tree Press is an imprint of Flame Tree Publishing, um, which has been around since the 90s, Flame Free Publishing has generally done lifestyle books, art, um, calendars, journals, things like that. Um, but in uh, 2018, they launched Flame Tree Press, and that's where I come in. It's the fiction imprint, uh, which is largely horror, but also science fiction, fantasy, and crime thrillers. Um, we do anywhere from 15 to sometimes 30 um, titles a year. Our books are uh, all in hardcover, trade paperback, and ebook. Uh, we're distributed by Simon & Schuster, so any librarian can find our books wherever they get Simon & Schuster books. Um, no doubt. Um, we, the sort of motto of the line is fiction without frontiers. And that is something that we've been trying to do. We've been trying to expand and push the boundaries. We've done some books that kind of blur the line between fantasy and horror or sci-fi and horror or sci-fi and mystery, you know, um, we really want interesting books and we have award-winning authors from Ramsey Campbell who has won more awards than any horror author alive literally um, to you know first-time authors uh, we want you know award-winning authors and fresh voices and that's what I'm looking for and that's what we want to bring into the libraries and we want to put it in the libraries, us, us librarians. So great, that works out really well. <laughs> oh, if I could mention one thing just before we move on, speaking of librarians. Absolutely. Uh, we do have a special offer that I wanted to mention for librarians who are registered for this event. Um, uh, any librarian who is registered, signed up for this event, will get uh, two arcs of our two biggest books in the coming year. Uh, one, Ramsey Campbell, The Searching Dead, which is coming out in February, and that's the first uh, of an epic trilogy that Ramsey has written. And the other is The Queen of the Cicadas by V. Castro, uh, which is coming out in June. Uh, she's a terrific author, uh, Latina. This novel is based on uh, folk tales that from her youth. So, you know, to show our thanks to the librarians here, we're happy to give you these arts and hope you enjoy them as much as we did. Wonderful. Thank you for mentioning that. I am sure um, those details will be included in the notes for this video when it is posted and when we go live. So people who are watching this are watching it uh, on the Horror Writers Association YouTube channel. So they don't entirely know what we're talking about. It's September right now when we're recording this. It's almost October. Um, so, but yeah, thank you for mentioning that. We will be sure to let all of our registrants know. 
Okay, so um, everybody, you gave wonderful introductions to yourself and to your works, but I would like all of you to talk a little bit more um, about your works so that people who are finding you for the first time um, in this video know a little bit more about what you write. Uh, so John, sorry, you're, you're on the chopping block again. Would you like to go first? I know you have a lot of books. You have a lot of books to talk about. So you don't have to give like a synopsis of every single one. Uh, but if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit more about, about what you write. Yeah, I can, I can just do five minutes on all 12. How's that? Okay. Go for it. Okay. I'll start my uh, clock. <laughs> Largely, um, I, I write supernatural horror. Um, I've always sort of said, you know, serial killers don't interest me that much. They're too much like real life. Um, so most of my novels have dealt with demons and witchcraft and the occult. And, uh, you know, I did a novel called Siren just to change the pace up a little bit and have a mythological creature as a monster. Um, but, you know, the last, uh, the last couple I've done, um, uh, the first one for Flame Tree was House by the Cemetery, which is actually based on some real life uh, ghost stories in the Chicagoland area. I grew up near a cemetery that's one of the nation's most haunted. Um, it shows up in a lot of those shows uh, and books with chapters about uh, haunted Illinois. Um, it's called Bachelor's Grove Cemetery. And there, there are a lot of ghost stories to go back to the 50s and 60s around that area. And I've always heard them growing up. It was kind of one of those things in Boy Scouts where you're sitting around the campfire and the kids talk about Oh my God, if you, if you go through the woods just a little ways that way, it's Bachelor's Grove. And, you know, then the, the older kids would try and freak us out. And, you know, anyway, fast forward, you know, 40 years, and I actually wrote a novel that's set in Bachelor's Grove. Um, it's not actually following the myths of, that, you know, ghosts walking around on the street outside or anything. It's actually um, about a house that they decide to turn into a haunted house attraction. Unfortunately, the house is already haunted and continues being haunted through the attraction, which as you can imagine, leads to a wonderful Halloween finale. Um, so that's, uh, that was my first book for Flame Tree. The next one was The Devil's Equinox, which is more of a Rosemary's Baby, um, you know, stepped up a notch. Um, it's a very sort of extreme uh, occult horror kind of book. Um, a lot of rituals and uh, sort of erotic horror overtones. I'm, I'm also, I guess, kind of known for that. A lot of my books have uh, fairly adult themes, so you don't tend to recommend those to the 12 year olds in the library. Um, however, adults I find frequently do enjoy them. Um, so that's, uh, that's the first two. And then Voodoo Heart is coming out. I believe the month this video is coming out um, in October. Um, that obviously is going to play into voodoo. Um, New Orleans is a city I've visited a lot over the years, uh, mainly for work, um, but I love the culture, I love the music, and uh, I wrote a, a short story back in 2003, um, which I have wanted to lengthen ever since, and finally, last year, I sat down and wrote the novel, and that's Voodoo Heart. So um, that's what I've done for Flame Tree. How's that? I didn't spend five minutes on each. No, you need to keep going. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I'll make you keep going because I have, well, I have a question. So growing up near this, this cemetery, um, safe to say that that was kind of an influence on your like interest in horror. I am, I always like to hear about pe how people kind of found horror, um, whether it was, you know, whatever movie they saw or experience they had. Yeah, it, it probably was. Um, it's certainly, you know, kids always tell ghost stories. And I think, um, you know, I was a kid who loved the Scholastic book catalog. Um, so I, I remember getting like some ghost story books and stuff out of that catalog. Honestly, as a reader growing up, I was more of a sci-fi kid. Um, I've dabbled in science fiction and short stories, but I, you know, I'm not really a science fiction writer. It's not the ideas that occurred to me. It's not what keeps me going as a writer. Um, so, you know, some point when I began to actually write stories, I think it was, you know, the creepy stuff around the campfire. It was watching Night Gallery and Outer Limits and Twilight Zone and, you know, Tales from the Dark Side. It was actually TV episodic horror that probably really prompted me to have all those twists and, you know, nasty turns at the end. Um, I, yeah. didn't, 
I didn't actually read horror novels until I was high school, college. Do you read a lot of horror novels now? Or is there kind of a, do you it's, stay away from I'm reading read it so that it doesn't part, influence yeah. too much? No, I, I, I actually, when I'm working on a novel, I almost never read anything because my free time is writing. Sure. So, yeah. So, which means I don't read nearly as much as I wish I did because I used to read all the time. Um, but, but yeah, it's lar largely horror, but you know, some dark fantasy, some sci-fi. Um, Great. Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll skip around. Um, sorry, you had to go first again, but I won't make, I won't keep the same order. I'll keep it, I'll keep it fresh. I would like to skip down to um, JH. Same question. If you could tell us a little, a little bit more um, about what you write, and then we'll get into kind of why. Okay. Well, I had, I did I give this some thought since you mentioned that this might be a question. And one <laughs> overall theme through all of my books, intentionally or not, I don't think it's intentional, is the sins of the past return to haunt us. Uh, in my books, it's literal. Uh, for some reason, no matter what I do, there usually is always a ghost. I've written a couple of creature features, but my books tend to have some sort of ghostly aspect to them. And it's always to do with some real life aspect of history, some people that have been treated poorly or uh, victimized in some way, and they come back for revenge. So it's a way for me to get in my travels, get in some of the things I'm very passionate about, human rights, uh, and still tell a spooky story. So the book I have out right now, A Flame Tree, is called Those Who Came Before. It's a supernatural mystery about uh, three people who are slaughtered in a campground. And as the detective who's indigenous or Native American starts digging more into it, she realizes that this campground is cursed and it has a long history running back of these terrible things happening. So it's been a way for me to explore some of the atrocities that were committed against Native Americans and some of the, those cultural stories, which I've always felt very passionately about. So that's it in a nutshell. I have the okay. more standard haunted house, the resurrection coming out with Flame Tree, I think next year. Don would, okay. Don would be a better uh, <laughs> on that to confirm. I wrote it. I did my part. All there I you go. <laughs> the pressure's on. But, uh, those who came before it's the one that's actually physically out. Great. Um, so same question, kind of what I was talking about with John in terms of um, influences or your sort of first experiences with horror, what kind of brought you to horror, I guess? I've always been attracted to scary books. Uh, when I was little, I used to always take out the ghosts, UFOs, uh, spooky true life monster stories from the library. They were all like fact, right? Not fiction. Yeah. And my mom would get so mad because I get horrible nightmares, but she never, she never tried to limit what I read, which was great. But I started writing horror because I was in a advanced English writing class in high school. And my professor hated happy endings. He called them Disney endings. He said he didn't want any Disney endings. Uh, so the easiest way to get around that and never have a Disney ending <laughs> was to write horror. And then he started calling me Stephanie Queen and it kind of caught on. And <laughs> so that's how it hooked me. But I've always, I've always been drawn to the dark side, for sure. Great. I like that. Do you, so do you read a lot of horror, kind of same you know, thing as John? Like while you're writing, are you not really reading so much and vice versa? I can't not read, although I sympathize with John. It is getting harder, especially teaching as well. It's getting harder and harder to find as much time as I'd like. For horror, primarily, I read more horror now than I used to because of my friends' books. I have so many wonderful friends who write horror that I want to support. Uh, but the majority of my horror, I would say, is true crime. And I read a lot of true oh. crime, and that is definitely horror. Uh, but for the most part, I, I tend to like to take a brain break when I read and, and read something lighter like travel memoirs or cozy mysteries even just so I'm not in the darkness all the time because what I write can be very emotionally draining and, and quite dark. Even when I try to do a cute little happy story about a haunted teddy bear, it ends up taking a very dark turn. So yeah, I like that break. Cookbooks, I love to read cookbooks. It's another thing. Right? So nice. That way. 
Thank and you. I hear you. Throw this in here uh, just to confirm uh, for Holly. The restoration is scheduled at this point for October, perfect for Halloween. Oh, yay. It exists. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> And yay for true crime. I, I too like to kind of, you know, blur my reading between horror and real life horror. So I hear you on that. Okay, um, JG, would you like to talk a little bit about the many books that you've written? Sure. Um, well, I already mentioned how I, you know, got my start in being interested in horror as a little kid. Um, one thing that probably plays a lot into it is I live down in the lower part of New York that they call the Haunted Hudson Valley, um, which just teems with ghost stories and haunted houses and UFO sightings and things like that. So that was all part of my formative years growing up. Um, as far as writing, uh, I'm a lot like John. I'm very oriented towards writing supernatural books. Um, that's been my wheelhouse for the things that I like to read and the things that I like to watch. And I just gravitate towards that when I'm writing as well. Uh, I'm not real big on serial killers or torture porn or that sort of thing. Give me a werewolf, a vampire, a ghost. But um, a few years ago, you know, back when I first started writing, one of my mentors told me, he said, you know, you take these things, these common tropes, these uh, classic stories, he goes, if you want to succeed in writing them, you've got to find your own unique twist to put on them. It can't just be a retelling of the same old thing. So I try and do that. Um, so uh, for instance, I just turned in a book to Don uh, that kind of combines a haunted house and an exorcism together. So for me, it was, it was always something I wanted to explore because one of the characters in the book is a teacher that I had when I was in college who uh, was an exorcist for the Catholic Church. So finally being able to work some of that into one of my books was great. You know, you always try and pull a piece of real life in there. Um, the other stuff that I've done for Flame Tree is um, much like what I write normally, it runs the gamut from uh, suspenseful paranormal type thrillers all the way to, uh, I guess, hardcore grindhouse type of um, horror that's in your face. And I don't want to say it's overtly violent or bloody or gross or anything like that, but it's dark humor. And it's uh, in horror, dark humor usually means some people are going to lose their heads. Uh, so that happens. Um, so with Flame Tree, I've got um, a couple of books out right now. One is called Hell Rider, and it's about a ghost who comes back from the grave to uh, get revenge on the people who killed him. And the other one that just came out a few months ago is called Sins of the Father, which was a little bit of a departure for me. I dipped my toes into the Lovecraft pool and kind of put a Mary Shelley Frankenstein twist on it because it deals a lot with a man coming to terms with his family issues while at the same time dealing with supernatural problems. Uh, and the reason it was a twist for me is because it takes place back in the 1800s and it doesn't occur in New York, which is where I've set a lot of my novels. It takes place in, England, in New England. Uh, so for me, that was a little bit of a fun to step out of my comfort zone a bit. Um, other than that, uh, most of my novellas and novels have dealt with some type of supernatural creature, whether it's a ghost, a demon. Um, I haven't done any novels with vampires. I kept that to my short stories. Uh, but, you know, some mythical creatures. And um, I try and keep them grounded in real life so that as you're reading it, sure, it's supernatural, it's horror but you want to try and make it believable so that the people reading it feel like they're in the story. Great. So for the kind of, you know, you, you've mentioned you write in a lot of different sort of, I guess, veins, you know, whether it's like the hardcore grindhouse, um, does that sort of, what comes first? Do you decide like I have this idea and this is what I'm going to do with it? Or is it more of I have this idea and you start writing a little bit and it kind of takes you in a sort of a certain direction? 
for me, it's always the idea that comes first. And that could be the overall plot, you know, the, the general idea of the story. It could just be the first paragraph of the story. It could just be the title. Um, a lot of times, you know, you get inspiration from a dream or a song or something like that, where you're just sitting there and you go, aha. So for instance, Sins of the Father, um, I wanted to write a Lovecraft novel because I'd done a couple of short stories and it was just something that I've really been interested in lately. And I couldn't think of anything that hadn't been done before. And I didn't want to just rehash stuff. So I was thinking about it for a few days, thinking about it. And I said, what if Mary Shelley had written something in Lovecraft, a Lovecraft setting? I said, now that would be pretty cool. So my monster wouldn't necessarily have to be uh, some demon from outer space or anything like that. And from there, everything just fell into place. And two days later, I had my whole outline put together. Very interesting. All right, Steve and Melissa, if you two would like to tell us about um, your books and your writing process and your influences and how you two found each other and decided <laughs> to write books together. <laughs> Sure. Um, so Stoker's Wild and Stoker's Wild West are both about Bram Stoker and Oscar Wilde. Um, in the first book, they they um, meet up in Dublin, uh, which in real life they really did, and they, they hunt a werewolf there, and then they both end up in London, and once you know it, some vampires show up there, so they have to take care of those too. Um, and then in the second book, they um, come to the come to America. And um, interesting thing was they in real life, they did both actually tour America at around the same time. So once we learned about that, we knew that that had to be part of the book. I'll let Steve jump in because I don't want to dominate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, originally came up with the the concept as I was doing I was going to do it. I heard that uh, Bram Stoker's boss, who was uh, the owner of the Lyceum Theater, Henry Irving, he he was sort of the inspiration for Dracula. You know, he worked nights, he was kind of a strange person. And so I thought, well, it'd be interesting to do a short story about uh, Bram Stoker having to really work for a vampire. So it was just gonna be a one-off short story. And then I started doing research on it and I found that he knew Oscar Wilde back in Dublin and that he stole Oscar Wilde's fiance from him. So I thought, well, that's got, now I'm starting to think, well, this is going to be a novel instead of being a short story, because we have to have Oscar Wilde come and hunt vampires too. So that's kind of the inspiration. I kind of got the ball rolling. And uh, so then, you know, we started, I read Dracula and found out it was an epistolary novel, which I didn't remember from reading it the first time. So we thought, well, we'll, we'll tell it in an epistolary format. So it's told in journal entries and it's in newspaper clippings. And it really gives us this great opportunity to write in different voices. So we're, you know, we're writing as Oscar, we're writing as Bram. Uh, it's interesting because sometimes we'll have the same incident from both points of view. And so that can be really fun. Uh, so that's kind of where that one came from. And like Melissa said, then when we found out they toured America together, it's like, okay, well, that's where the adventures we need to continue. So then it's, you know, cowboys and vampires, which yeah. has always kind of intrigued me. So I think it gives uh, us the opportunity to bring in more historical characters as well. We have um, Teddy Roosevelt makes an appearance in the second book and Calamity Jane is a pretty big character for most of the book too. So that's, it's really, it's really um, fun to kind of bring these historical figures into the story and see Oh, I wonder what Mark Twain would do with a vampire. <laughs> so. And then coming up, we have, um, uh, we're working on the third book in the series, which is called Land of the Dead, a Stoker's Wild novel. And that we start to delve into the Victorian um, craze for spiritualism and mediums. So we, we have some ghosts popping up. Great. So Don, how did you find Steve and Melissa and JH? Uh, Steve and Melissa, actually, uh, I met at a horror convention, um, you know, uh, StokerCon. Uh, I had uh, pitch sessions when authors come and talk to me about their books. And uh, they talked to me about Stoker's Wild and I 
loved it. I mean, it was a, you know, a terrific concept. Um, it seemed like so much fun, you know, so I asked them to send me the manuscript right away. I read it pretty quickly. And I think by the time of next, the Stoker Con after that, the book was already coming out. So, you know, it was just a great find. I actually met uh, John at, uh, John Everson at another uh, Stoker Con, um, or in those days it was HWA. Um, I meet a lot of authors that way, actually. It's a great way to find out what's going on. That's great. Uh, I think I met, uh, I think I met Holly at the uh, Stoker as well. I meet a lot of people at, at these pitch sessions. It's one of the main reasons I go. Perfect. Okay, so I know Holly, you mentioned a little bit about sort of the, the personal interest that you bring into writing horror and the um, kind of ideas that you're able to examine there uh, and things that you're passionate about that you are able to sort of kind of fold in and work through in horror. Um, how about anybody else? This one I'll just leave, raise your hand if you want to talk first. Um, what do you sort of get, I guess, out of, out of writing? Um, horror and specifically, you know, the books that you've written, what do you feel like, in addition to what you bring to them, because you write them, what do you feel like you kind of get out of them? Okay. So um, I think for me, uh, one thing that I, uh, for, just for our books personally, is it really gives me an excuse to delve into some of these um, historical eras and historical people that I didn't necessarily know a lot about. So in the upcoming book, um, just in the point where they are in their lives, Oscar Wilde is about to get married. So I recently read a biography of his wife and she was a really fascinating woman and I would never have really bothered to pick that up if it weren't for this book. So that's something that I really enjoy about our process in particular. That's great. And Holly, you don't have to like sit back. I didn't mean to say that like you already talked, so we're not talking about you anymore. <laughs> if you want to jump in as well, feel free. Um, John or Greg or Steve? I can, I can go. Um, I mean, for me, you know, I, I, I'm telling myself a story. So I write the kind of books that I want to read. Um, and while most authors do have some idea of how the story is going to go, um, you shouldn't probably start a novel length book without knowing where it's going to go. Um, not that I haven't done it, uh, but you know, it, all of the intricacies, a lot of the little finer plot points and stuff, like I start a chapter, I'm like, finish that chapter and go, wow, I didn't know that was going to happen. And, and that's fun. That's what makes writing fun is, you know, the, the, and it also is, you know, getting all that dialogue in your head, um, out of your head. Right. Um, I think most writers probably are people who have a lot of internal conversations um, and are constantly thinking of dialogue and things that people said and whatnot, but I know I do. Um, you know, it's fun to actually write dialogue, put it on a page and actually get it out of your head. Um, so yeah, to me, it's, it's, it's having fun. I've always written, I always knew I was gonna write. I was a journalism major. So writing has been my career on one side or the other, no matter what, but let's face it, writing fiction is a lot more fun than writing um, stories about the village board meeting, so. There. Greg, did you have something you wanted to, yeah. Sure, um, I mean, again, to sort of reiterate what John said, I do it uh, because I'm writing stories that I would love to read. Uh, I'm entertaining myself while I'm you know, doing this. And I think it's also a chance for you to learn things. Um, even if you're not doing a lot of deep research for a novel, um, you have to do some, uh, whether it's, you know, Victorian slang or what type of shoes somebody wore in, you know, 1930s Florida, you know, whatever it might be. Um, there's a little bit of learning there. And for me, that's always a big kick. You know, sometimes you can get lost in that research for hours at a time. And only 1% of it ends up in the book, but it, it is a lot of fun to create those stories and tell those stories. So uh, 
for me, it's something I'd rather do than watch TV or, you know, go to a movie or anything. Not that I don't like those things, but this is definitely more fun. I'm always amazed at the stupid things I'm Googling. <laughs> what is that thing called right quite... there before your elbow? <laughs> and the ones the police shouldn't see. Yeah, you don't want someone going through your Google history. <laughs> mm -mm. <laughs> Yeah, for me, I think it's, you know, world building and we, we got to play with history and rewrite history. And that was really fun too to, to insert. I mean, we don't rewrite it. We kind of, it's sort of a hidden history. And that was fun to really play with that and build an entire world around that. So. Yeah. Did you come from having a, just a, already having an interest in history? I, I guess you, you and Melissa, you know, did either one of you, were you just already interested in kind of history in general? Or did that sort of happen, you know, through horror and through finding out about, you know, Bram, or finding out more about Bram Stoker? Well, yeah, find, definitely finding out more about Bram, but also uh, one of my favorite books I read in the last few years was The Alienist by Caleb Carr, <laughs> where he really brings this whole, you know, Victorian New York to life and I just found, always found that fascinating with historical fiction so that's and also. yeah you, you feel like you know something about history and then you when you actually have to write a scene of you know a Victorian woman giving birth then you you have to <laughs> read about that and then you're really glad you were never a Victorian woman giving birth because that was <laughs> <not> fun <laughs> So for, for each of you, and again, this is like a, just volunteer yourselves. Um, what is your writing process? Or any little parts of your writing process? I mean, especially I'm, I'm interested in sort of Steve and Melissa who kind of write together. How, how does that work? <laughs> but for well, everybody, kind of what is, what's the, what's the process? Well, we yeah, tend to. your books come to be? Yeah. We, we each I'll do it. <laughs> work on a chapter, um, and then we'll we'll trade off and do the editing. So if one one person drafts it, then the other person edits it, and then um, we probably both edit it five more times ultimately before it gets sent off. Um, but that's that tends to be how how we work. Yeah, a lot heavy heavy outlining as well. We we okay. we find we really need an outline to not write ourselves into corners, and so we start with a very detailed outline. Don't have to stick to it, but at least we have something to, to keep us moving. Yeah, our, our next book coming up, I think we had a like a 20 page outline. It was enormous. As Don could tell you. Yes. <laughs> but it was very good. It was long, but it was very good. So do you, and again, I, I everybody else hasn't answered, but along with that too, do you have sort of a set, like, this is my writing time, you know, so like 7 p.m. at night, I'm going to sit down and work on this for a little bit, because I find as somebody who has published, you know, professional development texts and has not pu published any novels or anything like that, it's the discipline that's, that's the most difficult, especially when you're working, you know, other jobs and doing other things like that. How does that kind of, you know, and again, this is for, for everybody, how do you kind of stay disciplined um, with, with your writing? And I was like Brady um, Bunch, we're all looking down and looking to the side. No, I'll go. Um, okay. For me, the, my writing process is a bit schizophrenic and also very organized. Um, I probably at times have driven Don crazy over the years because I've always got eight or nine things going at the same time. A few novels, a couple of novellas, whatever it might be, some short stories. So I'll finish a novel and then it's time to you know, start working on the next one and I'll send Don a list. It'll say, all right, I've got this, 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 and this. Um, this one is this far. This one is this far. Which one would you like me to work on next? Um, and then that's the one I'll do. And even then, as I'm, you know, I could be two thirds of the way through a novel and all of a sudden I'll get an idea for a short story and I have to stop and write that story. Um, sometimes you can get away with just writing notes and coming back to it, but sometimes you just have to get it out. Uh, as far as my actual writing process, I start with the idea and I'll usually write the first chapter. And then at that point, 
I'll stop. And that's when I kind of put my outline together just so I know where this to go in the story and not get completely lost. Uh, and that could change as you go along, but at least for me, it's a rough storyline sort of. And then each day I write from seven to nine. And that's Monday through Sunday. And then during the rest of the day, you know, Monday through Friday, I have a job, I work my job. And then in the evening from, you know, maybe 4.30 to 5.30, I'll edit what I wrote in the morning. And I just kind of continue that way. And sometimes you'll get, you know, five or seven pages written in a day. Sometimes it might be only half a page. It all depends on how the words are flowing. Um, and that's one of the reasons I have so many things going is if I get really stuck, I just switch and start writing something else for a while. Uh, and sometimes that kind of just gets the brain flowing. But yeah, my schedule is pretty much set every single day. Interesting. Yeah, that's really interesting. John or Holly? Holly's been quiet. I want her to go. <laughs> She's petting a cat. I think <laughs> myself. Um, I keep talking about my process, which is why I was quiet. I always think everyone's going to think I'm insane or a freak. Uh, so I, I dread <laughs> talking about it. Um, but with me, basically, I guess it starts with, um, sorry. <laughs> Start with a cat. I warned you. I warned you. Um, <laughs> With me, it starts with a one line idea and then I wait and eventually a character shows up and starts talking to me. This is why it sounds insane and tells me the story. I have no idea what they're gonna say. I have no idea who they are in the beginning. So it's sort of like I get to know them throughout the book like you get to know someone you've just met. And they always surprise me. I never know how it's gonna end. I never know what's going to happen. So usually I'll get to the middle and I'll get terrified that even though I've written, I think as an adult books, I count, I think 17. I can't remember how many I published. I think 10. I'm not sure. So I keep telling myself, okay, you've done this over and over again. You're going to, you're going to be fine. Just keep writing and they will tell you what's going to happen. I still have that moment of fear where I have no idea what's going to happen. Uh, help. Uh, but they always figure it out. So with me, my characters very much become real people. They tell me the story. There's no outline. There's no planning. There's no nothing. So I've also driven Don crazy <laughs> for a different reason, because when Nick needs a synopsis, I have to basically say, well, I don't write that way, Don. You know, I don't write that way. And he says <laughs> something up. I do. And I hope that the book kind of sort of matches it at the end, uh, but usually doesn't. Because I honestly don't feel like I'm in control. So I don't know if anyone else writes that way, but that's how I write and that's how I've always written. And it sounds really weird, but. I the book is supposed to match the synopsis? I didn't know that. <laughs> I hope not. I really. <laughs> I looked at it after I'd written the book and went, oh, slight departure. Okay. <laughs> Make a few detours here and there. I try not to talk about it too much um, because it does seem very strange. I think it's useful to talk about it though because everybody has sort of a different personal process. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, processes change too. Um, I've honestly, I've done each novel a, a little different way. Like I'm, I'm not JG, I do not have an exact daily schedule. I have written that way. Um, you know, I think Siren, uh, my fourth novel, I actually got up every day before work. I got up at 5.30 and I did my hour and I would, I had a word count thing. And, you know, then on the weekend I would try and write more. Um, that just, it completely exhausted me so that, you know, after three or four weeks, I was useless for pretty much life. Um, so what I, I learned pretty early that there are a lot of writers who is like, okay, I have an hour or two every single day that I will write. Um, I could sit at the computer for an hour or two every day, say I'm writing and I will not produce anything. So for me, um, as a deadline driven journalist kind of person, it's all about word counts and deadline dates for delivery. Um, so I don't write anything unless I have a delivery date. That's kind of the way it goes. I, I will, I will make up my I will sit around and I will have my brainstorming sessions and I'll come up with a bunch of ideas and whatnot. But until 
I know that I'm really, really going to write this novel. Now that means I have created a synopsis and some, some, you know, outlines. I'm not going to sit down every day and work on doing it until I know I'm going to put it someplace because journalists know that their work is going to appear in the newspaper, right? That's how they get paid. Um, so I've always approached fiction writing in the same way. Um, but so for me, the, the biggest writing process thing is A, I create a basic outline and it's pretty basic. Don can attest that my outlines are not usually super long because I, I hate the paint by numbers feel. If you get too detailed, then I've got no leeway to actually tell myself that story that makes me entertained, right? Um, it's, it's already been done, why bother writing it if I've gotten too much detail in the outline? But you want the outline to save you and you know, at least tell you which big turns you should be making. Um, but so anyway, so I've, I've got that outline. I've, I've, you know, the big crux of the thing came to me. I outlined it. I, I have an idea of where it's going to go, Flame Tree Press. Um, and then I say, okay, well, in order to come out in this release month, 12 or 18 months from now, when do I need to deliver that novel, Don? And Don says, next month. And I say, well, no, let's be real. Uh, mm -hmm. But no, I mean, seriously, we will talk about like scheduling. I, you know, I want to appear in every calendar year if I can as a, as a novelist, um, but I personally am probably not doing more than one novel a year. So that's important is meeting a deadline. So we'll set that up and then I'll look at that deadline. I say, okay, in order to meet that deadline, I have to produce 4,000 or 5,000 or 6,000 words per week that are publishable text. And then I put that on, I literally put that on a calendar space it all out. I know most of my novels end up at around 80 or 85,000 words. So I figure out exactly how long it's going to take me to do that. And then that's my word count. And by Sunday night of every week, I better have produced it. I've produced that amount every week in various ways. The, the everyday thing doesn't work for me. So usually it's more of a, okay, Thursday nights, I go to my local bar <clears throat> and I, after work, because if I go home, I won't work. I'll hang out with my family and my birds. So I'll go to my local bar and I'll spend three or four hours and people bring me beer and I'll end up with 2,000 words. And then that means I've got to produce two or 4,000 words on the weekend. And so that tells me what I have to do on Saturday and Sunday. So that's, that's kind of my usual process. That's been a lot different during COVID since I can't really go to my local bar and write on Thursday nights, but I've made do. That's good. Someone's bringing you beer, right? It, yeah, you know. I, I, I actually built my own. Oh, so smart. <laughs> well, and I think it is, is, it's nice for people to hear what everybody's process is because nobody has the same process as, as another person. And I think, you know, aspiring writers or people who are writers but aren't published yet feel like they maybe have to do it a certain way to be a, you know, capital W writer or a published writer. Um, so I think it is nice to, and I appreciate everybody sharing because it's nice, you know, for people to hear that there's not any one way to do this and there's not any one way that makes you, I mean, what makes you a writer is that you write, right? Um, I think, I think so. the, only wrong, the only wrong process is not writing at all. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I think, again, and a lot of people who, who come to StokerCon, um, and obviously people who come to Librarians Day are librarians, but a lot of us librarians are also writers or we're trying to be in our own right. So it's very helpful to hear um, not only about your books, but also about, you know, you all um, as writers. And we appreciate you, you know, you sharing that. Um, so on that note, since we are coming up on an hour, but again, we don't have to cut anything off. Um, the thing that I'm going to ask you next is probably something you might roll your eyes at me about, and I apologize. Um, advice for writers, for aspiring writers, for people who want to have a book published, what would you tell them? I think I would, we found it really helpful to, to join a writing group so that you're mm -hmm. ac you're held accountable to another group and it's a there's a social aspect to it and that kind of makes it fun you know every thursday night we go meet with a bunch of people and and trade chapters and i found that very helpful and if, even if it doesn't produce something you've got it's a nice hobby it's a nice social thing and and then also just having other people having your alpha readers that can help you mm -hmm. craft the story and 
and change things. So that would be probably my biggest advice is just find other people that are that are into what you're into and form a group. It's really easy these days with social media and you know meetup.com and things. So I think I'd, that would be my biggest thing that helped me at least. Great. Thank you. Um, for me, the advice I would give is pretty basic. Number one is write. Don't be afraid to write. Just sit down and write. And remember that a lot of what you write is going to be crap, especially in the beginning. And even now, after 20 years of writing, my first drafts are crap. Uh, I usually go through eight drafts before I turn something into done. I mean, it's just, I, I get really fed up with myself. Um, so write, just keep writing and writing and writing. The more you write, the better you're going to get at it. Um, writing groups, again, that's a definite, definite must. Um, and they should be people who are as good or better than you are and who are going to give you a totally 100% honest opinion. Um, when you send something to them, it should come back scrawled with red ink all over it. Because if it doesn't, if they're just saying, oh my God, that was so great. You did an excellent job with it. They're not helping you. You want people that are going to make you better. And the, uh, the third thing is, you know, really working with an editor. You know, Don has been incredibly helpful in making my work better. So after that goes to my beta readers and then it goes to him, it comes back with, comments, suggestions. Um, you know, a lot of times we work out story arcs and things like that even before the novel's written. So, you know, that's also important. And finally, just don't get discouraged. Writing is, you know, 75% failure all the time. So you've got to expect rejection before you can get acceptances. <laughs> If I can just comment from sort of the other side of the desk, absolutely. You know, from an standpoint, uh, to echo what Greg said, um, not giving up, perseverance is key. Uh, don't be discouraged. Uh, there are a number of authors that I've published over the years where I rejected the first manuscript they sent me or I rejected the second manuscript, sometimes the third. And manuscripts can be rejected for a lot of reasons other than quality. Uh, my inventory might be very high. My schedule might be full. I might have just bought a book with a similar plot. You know, there are so many things that aren't only about the quality of the manuscript. So don't take it personally if an editor me or whoever uh, says no, uh, you know, keep trying. If, if you give up when you get your first rejection, you're never going to make it. Uh, and the other advice I would give is whatever genre you write in, I mean, here we're talking about horror, uh, you know, read a lot of books in that genre. The more you read, you know, the more you'll know what various tropes are, what plots are, various conventions. Uh, you know, you'll find your own voice by reading other people's voices. Not in any way that you should copy them. You know, you want to be individual, but know what is in the genre, what's out there, know what's being published at any given time so you can see what some trends are, what might be popular now, what might be getting a little tired, you know. So just my view from sort of the other side. No, that's appreciated. Because people can, I mean, you do accept submissions through your website, correct? Flame Tree Press? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, writers should go to submissions at Flame Tree Press. The website, uh, you know, flametreepress.com. Uh, um, and we have guidelines and how to submit and, you know, everything it tells you very, you know, it's the standard things, double spaced and you know, that kind of thing. But it'll tell you, you know, our word length, you know, don't send a 20,000 word novella. That's too short for us. Don't send a, you know, 300,000 word novel. We can't do it. So look at the website, 
uh, and to see the kind of things we're looking for. And it, it's very helpful. Great. Thank you. Yes, Holly. I'd just like to echo the persistence thing. Um, I, I did write some books earlier on that I couldn't find a publisher for or an agent for, or I found an agent and they didn't work out. Um, so even though I went on and I wrote more books, I kept still every now and then querying those old ones. And the most money I've ever made for a book by far was a book that I'd written 12 years before that. And it could have given up on it. So you just never know if you keep persisting, you never know when that's going to suddenly pay off for you. Another thing I'd say is pay attention to opportunities. When opportunity, when you know you hear opportunity knocking jump, how I originally got published the first time, I was working on a novel and a friend who published romance uh, got this uh, newsletter from a publisher called Sam Hain that was a big romance publisher in the day. and. They were looking for, she saw the horror branch was looking for childhood fears, novellas about childhood fears for this collection. It was sort of like a, an open call or a contest. And I remember she sent it to me and I said, do you think I should do this? Like, should I take time off from my actual, like the book I'm working on to enter this? And she said, yeah, yeah, do it, do it. So I did. And that was the first novella. That was the first any book I ever got published. That's how I met Dawn. That's how I met Greg. That's how I sort of met John, haven't met him in person, but that's how I became connected with everybody here. Um, so if I hadn't taken that opportunity, who knows, right, how much longer it would have taken me. So when you see those little calls, or you, and Flame Tree has them all the time for anthologies, um, only Dawn can speak to, does it kind of help pave the way if you've had stories published in the anthologies to get a novel in? I'm not sure, but it can't hurt. And they have calls for them all the time. So when you see those calls, when somebody tells you about something or offers to introduce you to their agent, or you just see those little things pop up and you will, jump at them, make the time. It's so worth it. You just never know. Yeah, I, I would echo that. I think um, with, with Stoker's Wild, we've been submitting it and, and trying to get it out for a while. And um, we're thinking about self-publishing and then we saw StokerCon coming up and it's like, oh, Stoker, Stoker, we, we got to check that out. And um, but there's a lot of really interesting publishers accepting pitches at the, at the con and we decided to give it a shot. So um, definitely pay attention to the opportunities that come your way. That's great. Thank you. Okay, well, we're coming up on an hour does anybody have anything at all they want to say? This is where we would like allow the audience to ask you guys questions, um, but we can't do that right now because we will be getting them via email uh, once the video is live uh, and then we will pass the questions along. So, you know, we can't do a live Q&A right now, but if anybody has anything they want to say about anything, no, I'm just kidding probably keep it on topic. Um, <laughs> here's your chance. I'm just saying, you know, happy to answer questions when they do come in, because uh, I figure that's a good way to find out what people actually want to know instead of the things we've been saying. Right. <laughs> Perfect. Um, where can people find you? Hopefully they can find your books in their local library, but you people, where can they find you? Social media? Websites, blogs, etc. Who wants to go first? I'll go first. We're on uh, we're Stoker's Wild on Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, uh, and Goodreads. So just googling Stoker's Wild as the handle will you will find our pages. So perfect. I'm pretty easy. Um, JGFarity.com is my website. And then on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, it's just J.G. Faraday. No periods, just J.G. Faraday. And uh, I'll pop up. Perfect. Probably easiest way to find me is just flametreepress.com. Perfect. I'm easy as well. I've been in this game long enough that I could stake out my name as a handle pretty much everywhere. So I, I am at johnneverson.com. I'm at Facebook, John Everson. I'm at Twitter, John Everson. 
Instagram, however, made me go Nightwear Man. So if you look up Nightwear, you can find out where that handle comes from. It's uh, my, my other Stoker nominated novel, um, most extreme thing. But yeah, mostly you search Johnny Everson, you're gonna come up with me. Perfect. Yes, uh, jhmoncrief.com is my website. And from there, there's tags to all my social media, but Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, Facebook, it's all J.H. Moncrief. I'm not hiding. Perfect. You can't. No. <laughs> you gotta self-promote, right? <laughs> yes. I try to hide whenever possible. But... <laughs> it's tempting. Well, thank you all again so much for joining us. Um, it would have been lovely if we could have all been together at StokerCon <laughs> this year. Um, sorry we couldn't have been. Hopefully we will be soon, sooner than later. Everybody wear your masks and wash your hands um, and stay safe. Uh, and yeah, look for this video on the HWA YouTube page when it's live uh, November 1st. Thank you for getting us all Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Thanks. Thank you. No problem. Appreciate it. It's nice to finally see you all in person, kind of. <laughs> next year. We'll all be together next year. That's right. Oh, Fingers okay. crossed. Yes. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye bye. Happy Halloween. You too. Yes. <laughs>